this might be jumping around a little bit, but you talked about your continuous glucose monitor. And I think a couple of people asked about that because they realized that you have a CGM and you're not diabetic. It's usually when you have a CGM, people say, aren't you diabetic? Because it's what it's typically used for. So we could get into a, why do you, why do you wear the CGM? And then probably a pretty nerdy game of would you rather, which is obviously not the glucose, but let's say like an OGTT with insulin. Would you rather see that in a patient or if a patient could have the, you know, the Dexcom five or whatever the latest and greatest is, and you knew exactly what they ate for like a month and you could follow those numbers where are you going to learn more about that patient through one of those tests or the other? Uh, boy, that's a good question. I think that to have CGM data on a patient, and a lot of our patients don't want to wear a CGM, although I think that's going to change with the Dexcom G6. So I, you know, I started my career using the G5. No, um, <laughs> you know, the G5 I loved, but I could understand why if you didn't actually have type, you know, diabetes, you know, that was a bit of a, a bit of a stretch because, you know, you're, you're inserting this needle and it was, you know, it was just a bit more involved. Plus, it required calibration twice a day. Uh, then a company called Libre got bought by Abbott, and they had a no calibration one that got quite popular, but we've used it a lot, and I find it to be categorically useless. It's so inaccurate, and you can't force a calibration. Uh, also, it doesn't have, you can't, it doesn't interact with your phone. So it's just like useless in that regard. So, do those both use a needle in the same place? The Libre is typically inserted on the back of the arm, and it's a, it was at the time a much easier way to insert. The new Dexcom G6, which I don't think is out yet, but I've been lucky enough to have a prototype for a while, uh, the, the, the G6 inserts the same way as the Libre. It's, it's, it's plug and play. It's trivial. It requires, you don't even feel it going in. It's a much smaller needle. It goes in much faster, so you don't, you're, not, you're not the one responsible for the velocity at which it goes into you. And it also doesn't require calibration. Though you can, I, I still spot check mine once a day. I've been blown away by the accuracy and its interface with the phone is second to none. So it's just, uh, it's just, it's, it's amazing. I think in reality, if I had a month of CGM data with accurate food information, that's probably more valuable to me than the OGTT, even though I'm giving up insulin, meaning I'm not going to get to see the insulin, but I also get to see, you know, a month of someone in their real environment eating the likelihood that I'll miss in that entire month, because they're going to probably eat something really bad. And if I can see how they're reacting to that, uh, you know, that's probably pretty good. But look, it's still not a complete substitute for that hyperinsulinemia. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's not perfect. But I also find that the CGM for me is one of the, it's along with the, my sleep ring, it's the stickiest device I've ever used. Whereas any other wearable I've ever used, it's like after two weeks, I don't want to wear it anymore because I've already learned what I need to learn. Like I know how many steps I take. Why do I care? So I've got this whole theory around what wearables matter. You know, it's like, are you measuring something that matters? I don't want a wearable that's telling me something that's irrelevant clinically. Is the device actually measuring what it claims to be measuring? Is it, am I able to get feedback in real time? Because that was the problem with the Libre is you couldn't get real time feedback you know, unless you were going to carry around this other device it came with. Whereas with the Dexcom, you're getting real-time feedback. And so as real-time as exists, meaning when you eat something, you don't see your glucose move at that moment. But I certainly know after a meal how that meal or the amount of exercise or the amount of stress I was under impacted things. And then do I have an ability to sort of fix it? Do I have any control over the outcome? So, you know, CGM for me has continues to this day, even though we're probably three years into doing this stuff. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a day when I'm not going to want to know my glucose every minute of every day. <laughs> How much of those two things, particularly the CGM, maybe the, the ring too, because you're, you're talking about a lot of things, probably sleep, exercise, diet, et cetera. Are these things almost like accountability coaches that the idea that you get this real time feedback of the stuff that you're eating if you're going to eat some crap, whatever it is, you know that it's going to show up. Do you think that there's any of that aspect to those things? For me, there definitely is, especially on the glucose ring. I had a buddy stay here last night and like after we, we went out and grabbed dinner and then on the way home, he's like, oh, do you mind if we stop at the store? I want to get some stuff for the morning. And he you know, got a little box of granola 
and so you know this morning you know get up to our thing and he eats some of the granola but left the box and as he left i'm like god damn it like i love granola but like it's candy it's not it's nice like you know so i just threw it out immediately like open the thing threw the granola out and make sure i wouldn't eat it and in part i think it's that i know that if i eat it i have to look at my cgm just go up and it just pisses me off so it's like i'm not going to do it and maybe if I didn't have that CGM, I would have mainlined that whole box of granola. There's a question in here that I have to get to because it might relate to this. It says, how do you, how do you think having children has changed you, has changed you most? I often think of like what's at the dinner table and what's left over in terms of your, you know, if you want to call it willpower or food that's left over, that might come into play. I mean, I hate to blame my kids for anything, <laughs> but I'm easily 10 pounds heavier and 10 pounds fatter thanks to them. <laughs> I think the biggest issue is the food environment. You know, here in New York, I eat really well because you mean you see my kitchen. The worst thing I'm going to do, yeah, yeah, the worst thing I'm going to do is have a little extra almonds tonight. <laughs> like, there's just nothing bad to eat in here. And this is where I'm at my weakest, is when I'm, you know, in my place. And it's not to say I don't go out and eat a burger and fries sometimes because certainly New York offers more of amazing, decadent food than any place else. But I, I think we're most vulnerable in the environment that we eat most. And, you know, for some people that's work, for some people it's home, whatever. And so I think that the challenge of having kids, at least for me, is that you just have more kid food around and try as you might to say, we're not going to have that kind of stuff in our house. I mean, look, I, I'm guessing my kids eat better than most kids. You know, they don't have juice in the house, soda, like a couple times a year. There's like, you know, some diet Coke after a birthday party or something. But you know, for the most part, it's pretty good. But there's still a bunch of crap. Like, you know, those crackers, wheat thins. My son, who you know very well, he calls them wheat thins. <laughs> and he freaking loves those things. Like it's all he wants to eat. And he comes home from daycare and he's like, Daddy, I want some wheat thins. And I'm like, what? Wheat thins. I don't know. What are you talking about, Reese? We thins. Oh, wheat thins. Got it. So, and we I'm not thin. We not, we not thin. And those things, I mean, those. I don't know if you've had one of those in yes, a while. Yes, I have. They, they are, are freaking awesome. Yeah. I, they must be just, they're so, I don't remember them being that sweet when the, I was a the kid. The texture too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I remember, yes, I, there was a period. I would stack them up, I think, too. Maybe stack I, I up feel, a couple yeah, of them. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No. <laughs> you don't eat those things one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, Will Ferrell in, uh, in, what was that hilarious movie? Oh, old School. Old School. It, was, yeah. it just feels so good when they just hit your lips. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing is there's just, like a lot of the times, like if I'm, you know, the kids will want homemade mac and cheese, which is like nowhere near as bad as the crap you get out of a box. But look, it's still mac and cheese. And if they don't finish it, I still have this immigrant mentality I grew up with, which is like, you don't throw food out, which is horrible. But I was really raised like that was so instilled in me that you don't throw food out. So if my kids don't eat their mac and cheese, I'm like, yeah, I got to eat it. And part of that's just, I want to eat it. Yeah. But part of it's <laughs> like, I really don't want to throw it out. Right. So I'm just as likely to finish off their salmon or steak as I am their, uh, their mac and cheese. So... I don't know. I mean, I think the benefits of having kids have probably outweighed that, but that's definitely a drawback of having kids. So I, before we leave the lab test, this is technically not a lab test, but I've heard you talk about it a lot. And it's something that people probably could do and it might be a good exercise for them. And that is family history. It can tell you a lot about your risk, maybe more so than some markers. Can you talk about the importance of that? A little bit yeah i think it's i think it's certainly more important than doing a whole genome sequence so i've had a number of patients i mean at least half my patients over the last few years have have either done a whole sequence or at the very least done you know something like 23 and me and we run that through prometheus and i'm trying to think of a single time when anything in there altered our treatment plan uh, beyond what we already knew. Maybe the odd patient that shows up with a Tom 40 mutation who was otherwise an APO33 that you think, okay, you're probably a little higher risk than we thought for Alzheimer's. So maybe that's one exception. Uh, you know, we get some insights into caffeine metabolism, but we almost always know the answer before we, you know, we look for it just based on what they tell us clinically. But the family history is incredible. And a lot of the times you can see things in family history like you can 
often spot an elevated LP little a before you get the bloods back. Cause usually I've done a history and a physical on a patient before I get their first blood test back. And it's not uncommon for me to see just a violent streak of heart disease in a family and be like, okay, you're going to have an elevated LP little a, there's no two ways about it. And sure enough, they come back and it's high and you could see that their dad had it, their dad's mom had it, their dad's mom's mom had it. And, and you just sort of, cause it's a co-dominant inherited gene. So you can see how it rattled through the family. Certainly also gives you a great insight into cancer and dementia as well. Less, I mean, I think dementia is harder because obviously the further you go back, the less long people were living and you don't mention the insight, but, but as a general rule, we, we really look for the mosaic and pattern of, of a person's predicted mortality based on their genes and things will skew it. You know, your parents smoked and you don't smoke and they're getting disease all over the place. It's, it's hard to infer there. You know, I, I, we, I have a patient whose mom just died um, very recently from lung cancer, but it was non-small cell lung cancer. So, so, you know, what do you do with that? She was a heavy smoker. He's not. Does that really increase his risk? I mean, as you know, we do a staggering amount of work on cancer screening in our patients. And you've, you basically are the guy who runs our model on that. And it's actually a cancer by cancer issue. There are some cancers in which, you know, a first degree relative that has it, it's a big, you know, and sometimes it's not obvious, like the first degree relative that has bladder cancer and what's the relationship to you having prostate cancer or vice versa. So when we do the cancer screening in particular, we have the patients go back and do an even more detailed double click on their family history of cancer. So yeah, I think family history is probably one of the more important things we get out of the history on the patient.